All right. All right, everybody. Yeah, we're live, man. I think we are. <laughs> I, I would assume so. If not, I'll let you know. Yeah, we're live. Um, cool. Yeah. How's everyone doing? I hope everyone's doing great today. We are starting now, and I have a guest that I wanted to have for a while now, and finally it's happening, and I'm super happy because I've been following your work, dude, for a long, long time, and I can tell from the amount of people that have been excited to see the stream, I can tell you uh, I'm not alone <laughs> <laughs> with that thing. So uh, here we have the infamous, legendary, freaking Spart, man. How are you, dude? Very much, yes. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm uh, just uh, coming back home a few a few hours ago from work and the routine and all. And, uh, <laughs> you're just like pushing me to learn new tech, so that's pretty badass. <laughs> because I'm just an, an oldie and, uh, and I need to just like stay up to date when it comes to all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's, it's all right, man. It's, it's not that hard. It's like, if you stay out of the loop, it looks very complicated, but it's literally just a couple of clicks. <laughs> I managed to do a few videos uh, for Gummo, so that's pretty good. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was trying to find the time for that, you know. That's awesome, dude. So, so I met, I met you on, on the airport, actually, on the way to THU, I, like, in, in person, but I knew your work for like the longest time. And I think we had maybe a chance to talk before, I think on Facebook or something, uh, maybe, maybe email. I, I know uh, you've been talking with Ash uh, a little bit. So, yep. so that was going on, but, but like really... I, was dying, I, I feel bad because uh, Ash wanted to just like, you know, have me participate a bit more and just do, do stuff. But uh, I'm, it's just uh, crazy. Fuck, him. fuck that guy. <laughs> no, joking, <laughs> obviously. <clears throat> Me and Ash are really good friends. Um, anyways, yeah, I, I met you on like I was I was waiting on my plane in Washington, and we were going to THU. And I was like, damn, I think I recognize that face. <clears throat> I've, I've seen I've seen this guy before, and it's a it's a plane to Port Portugal, and if it's a recognizable face, that must be this guy. So I just came over like hey are you smart <laughs> uh it was so fun but finally yeah, met you man we we hung out in uh in in troya it was fun that was definitely a lot of fun man getting yeah, to know you a little better yeah. um uh so for those who i mean a lot of people that are gonna watch this they already know who you are um but you know there might be a a soul or or, or two that will stumble upon this video it's like who is this guy Who's 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 this Nicolas Bolvier person? Who is it? <laughs> yeah, let's, let's maybe introduce you a little bit, like who, who right. you are, uh, you know, what what you do, and all that stuff. All right, let's just give a few intimate details or whatever. Uh, <laughs> I was born in France in 1971, uh, in the southwest, close to the Spanish frontier in the Pyrenees, and as soon as 1981. Um, we were living in the Southwest and ended up in Paris and my parents told me, uh, we're going to go live abroad. So that's what we did. We went to live in Singapore. Uh, and then I went to live in the U S and then I went back to live in Singapore. My parents lived in China. So as a result, I've been a bit of a world traveler at an early age. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically when it comes to, Art specifically, I, uh, I've been uh, sketching and painting since I was five. Uh, it's the only thing I could really be good at, I would say, even mm. though maybe the level I, I had back in the days was maybe my perception was maybe different, but I felt I had something with this. And since I've, I'm five, I've never really, uh, you know, stopped, I would say. Uh, a few good moments, I would say one strong point is that uh, back in uh, 1984, I was, uh, I was a pretty shitty student, you know. Uh -huh. I was pretty bad at uh, learning a new language, and I was living in Singapore, and my parents were just kind of panicked. They were like, um, oh, my gosh, what is our kid is just going to do with his life, you know. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, slacking, to be honest, and even uh, I was like, what, 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. And they told me, we're going to send you to your aunt and your uncle in the U.S., and uh, my aunt is French, and my uncle, who died now, uh, was uh, from Pennsylvania and was from the U.S. Mm -hmm. And they've been living in Florida. I went to their place, and I spent a bit more than a year, an amazing time, 
uh, at their place, and they were. Um, my uncle at that time was working for uh, the NASA, and my aunt was working at the Kennedy Space Center. And as a result, uh, because you live in Cocoa Beach, because you're surrounded by space stuff, uh, you see the space shuttle many times. You see rockets take right. off. You get out of the school. Uh, you know, you get out of the classes to actually every time you know that there's been uh, there's going to be a rocket or the space shuttle scheduled. This is 1984. It's a golden era of. Uh, Name of, I'm already you know. jealous. <laughs> so we were getting out of the classes and watching, uh, you know, the whole thing from Cocoa Beach is quite a few miles away, but the sound is already insane. You know, it's like a <clears throat> something you never really forget. And I've seen it probably like three or four times back in 1984. You had quite a few launches per year, plus all the rockets, you know. So yeah, that's why I, I think that stuff really just shaped me. Uh, shape who I was among many other things, but the the fact of being exposed like so, that early to the space program and to something as insane as the space shuttle taking off and living in the city where that happens right. is just such a such a great event, you know. And I guess it never really left me. I, I'm always having that influence, you know. So this was fiction, and there you have it. <laughs> yeah. What, what what kind of what better can you get? Like what? What better events around you can you get to get really inspired, huh? <laughs> That's so insane. Yeah. You know, it's, it. uh, everything that has that is connected to space in this way is just like uh, unforgettable. You know, you you it just shapes you up as a kid. It it just gives you these foundations and 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 it just shakes you. It just baffles you so much. You know, and yeah. I guess it had a huge impact, definitely. Do you think um, it inspired you to who you are right now? I think it does when it comes to uh, how passionate we are about uh, defining the Apollo space program, defining uh, even from a design standpoint, you know, looking at white surfaces using Ridley Scott in 1979, uh, Alien, and all these references that we all use and that have been driving a lot of uh, the science fiction and our science fiction principles and philosophies uh, <laughs> since the 70s it's true that uh, a lot of that stuff is coming from the space programs you know yeah and uh, and it, it's definitely an influence that's a short time dude speaking of ridley scott i had a chance to work with him uh right pre right before going to thu man it's so fucking insane to have a, have a, even like a short conversation with that guy and um, I went, I went to his offices for a meeting. I was sitting there for. I, I, he was late. He, he was stuck in some other meeting, and um, I was sitting there and waiting. I looked at the wall. I was like, "Holy fuck!" It was like f set photos from Alien from '78 and '79. <laughs> it was like, you know, original photos with the descriptions and his notes and all that stuff. And yeah, I'm just looking all around and like holy shit like all of that stuff that is being on the wall uh yeah. was made have, bef before my parents even met you know <laughs> you know i have two really great souvenirs when it comes to this the first one is uh actually uh back in the in 1998 i was working for um for a few months with my friend Mathieu Lofray. we were working uh he actually brought me on the production of uh 20,000 leagues under the sea and it was done by uh I think Jeunet at that time, and the, uh, the the production designer was probably like Jean Rabas, worked on the City of Lost Children and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was working on that production for just like two months, you know. And the interesting thing, and uh, it was on the Metropolitan Film Export Office on the Champs Elysees in Paris. And I will always will always remember that because when you enter into uh, when you were entering into these offices, there was a full floor dedicated to all the concepting for the so mm -hmm. for, it was for the Christophe Gans next movie that did not happen. Christophe Gans did uh, Crying Freeman back in 1994. I think he also did uh, The Brotherhood of the Wolves or something like that. Right. And he had also, uh, you know, quite a few uh, other uh, ventures and, and, and things he was interested in. He, he had a, a line of video product called Ashka Video back in the days that was actually making, uh, like, giving to the French public a lot of the um, Hong Kong cinema videos back in the 1990s. Mm. Anyway, and I enter into that office for the first time, and Mathieu tells me, oh, come on, I'm just going to have you meet the team and all that. And on the wall in that studio, you had a lot of sketches, and among others, you had sketches from Philippe Druillet. 
And the originals, the original sketches from Druy on the wall, you could just touch them. Uh, and same when it comes to uh, Olivier Vatin. And Vatin is uh, is uh, one of the um, this French uh, comic book artist that did mm-hmm. uh, a full, like a full series called uh, uh, Aqua Blue at that time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually on Avaton if you look at it because you have a lot of common points with uh, with Avaton. And uh, Vatin did a lot of these sketches for for Jean Abbas and for these guys, if I remember correctly. This is like so many years ago. But you could just touch the paint on the <laughs> you know. These were the originals. You were not having as many uh, options for prints back in 1998. So they were putting all that stuff on on the wall. You could touch the Druillet originals. That's so crazy. It just had an impact on me. But yeah. a bit recent like back in 2013 i'm a bit like 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 you on this i never ended up in california as 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 you know but i still really had uh you know uh quite a few guys on the phone and also uh, arthur max he really wanted me to come and work with uh with ridley scott back in 2013 or 2012 and you know when you have him on the phone for the st- first time and arthur max tell you tells you something like hey nick and do you want to really join us? Because uh, with Ridley Scott, we know your stuff, and we're very, we really want you to join us. And it's just like suddenly you kind of melt inside, and you're like, <laughs> I've been working all that, you know, these years for, 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 for all these things, and it's just a fun, an anecdotic recognition, but it's still, yeah, you know, it's still something, you know. No, yeah, I mean, when you meet meet an actual legend, and whether you meet him or have a conversation or have a possibility an offer yeah. or whatever that is it's already sort of like very humbling because then you just look back at your career is like fuck like did i do i deserve that stuff you know <laughs> in a way it's like especially you know really in my books is like in this regard some of some of his uh movies that i'm not a big fan of um the more recent ones um but that's my subjective opinion. But in my books, he's one of the best directors ever, like ever, I mean, right? Blade, Blade, Runner, Blade Runner and and, Alien. and Alien, two best movies ever made. I mean, for it's reals. Insane. It forged uh, nowadays science fiction in so oh, many yeah. ways and video games in so many ways. We are still always referring to these movies as the ultimate mecca of. Uh, um, successful design. For example, yeah. I've been, I watched the the new Blade Runner, which is actually uh, kind of amazing. It's in its own way, and uh, that's a full conversation that we could go I haven't into. Haven't seen it yet. But the interesting bit, though, without actually having any spoilers at all, is that um, the thing I regret a tiny bit, and this is just really from a design standpoint, uh, the fact that you have so much uh, pristine and clean imagery now mm-hmm. when it comes to. Uh, the description of all these movie sets and all that goes with it. And I kind of regret the gritty and a bit more like realistic and and, and down-to-earth right. gritty period. <clears throat> when you look at Ridley Scott and what he did on uh, on uh, on um, Blade Runner in 1982 is that uh, you, you feel the dirt. You really yeah. feel, breathe the dirt. You can really breathe that. Uh, Denis Villeneuve, because of his style, was, is just a bit more clean. Into his, uh, he's a, a master composer, and that's a sure fact. But sometimes there's a bit of an emptiness that is, for me, a bit detracting when it comes to the Blade Runner um, philosophy. It's one of the only small downside I'm finding on that movie because everything else is really mind blowing. And I gotta say, on top of that, you have a few sequences in what Denis Villeneuve did. No, no, it's just genius cinema. It's like emotional. Yeah, I love, I love the director. I love the work he does. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really mind blowing in many ways. You know. Yeah, I knew, I knew, I haven't seen the movie yet. I want to see it, but um, I know, I know it's getting amazing reviews. It's apparently flopping in terms of financials. Um, it's not, not being yeah. well perceived by the audience. Well. I mean, I've heard people... mixed views about how much uh, it really did in, in terms of financial uh, on the financial side. At first, they said it's a flop. Then I've heard uh, like like other articles saying it's not that much of a flop. And then now again, it's a flop. And I'm like, where are we on this? And well, it's not making Transformers money, so you can you know the problem with that is if it's not making if it's not considered a hit, then it's 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 gonna hit the whole genre. 
because then you know studios would just look at the numbers like oh this is not really making that much money we have we have transformers 10 coming out and china <laughs> is buying fucking gazillions of chick of tickets we're gonna make another 10 transformers movies you know that's that's how it works in this in yeah. this in this business frankly that it, it is what it is but I mean, for the standpoint of, you know, knowing how, how masterful this movie probably is, I haven't seen it, so but I'm assuming from from what I heard, and knowing how good of a director Dennis is, I mean, I've seen Sicario, I've seen Arrival, those two movies are so fucking well done. Yep. And that Sicario scene on the on, on the border, so I watched have you seen be any better Blue thing Blue ever? Side here, I still have the Blu-ray that I have not seen because... I can't watch that with my kids. Uh, oh. as, a, as a result, it's been staying on the shelf, but I'm going to watch it like super oh, as soon. Oh, as... okay. I'm not going to say anything more than just watch it. Just but watch I already it. bought it. I have it. Uh, Perfect. Right but, but yeah, um, I mean... Uh, so, to, to... Oh, just one thing. We, yeah, I go went, ahead. Sorry. When I actually went to the uh, theater mm -hmm. three days ago to go see Blade Runner, there was that lady in her 50s in front of me with her kid, or maybe she was 40-something. Her kid was like, I'd say, 16, 17. And they were not really exactly knowing what to watch. And I could spot, you know, they were just in front of me, and I could spot that they were really hesitating. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, well, let's just go see Blade Runner. And she was going to purchase the tickets. And then I tell her, you know, it's actually a, a, a three-hour movie. It's a bit less than three hours. And she said, oh, my gosh. <laughs> no way I can watch a three-hour movie right now. Thank you so much for telling us. So I don't want to retrieve Vina for like for, 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 for 25 bucks of these two uh, very nice <laughs> people. But it's true that uh, that's what happened. You know, mm. a, a two-hour and 45-minute movie is clearly not mainstream and they're paying the price for this. And right. at the same time, I'm like, Makes sense. it's frustrating because fuck it, you know, if it's a 2.45 minute uh, hour movie, if that's what it did, I, I was never bored by that movie. You have long right. moments, it makes sense. You know, so much of the entertainment industry uh, in games and movies is driven by action for the sake of it. When you yeah. have a director that comes in and that is going to be installing a pace that is just not specifically action driven where you have action because it makes sense and not because you need to have that in front of your fucking beer. <laughs> you need to be rewarding that, you know? Yeah. And man. Look, look, looking back at looking back in time, you know, apocalypse, apocalypse now was three hours, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was yeah. one of the best movies it's ever made. Um, looking at Kubrick movies as well. I mean, fuck. There's so many. There's so many good examples of really good movies that were long. You know, Shit! Uh, what was the what was that movie? Uh, Gone with the Wind, right? It's not really an action movie. It's like a melodrama, right? But it was a four hour movie. I don't know. I don't know if take, you know. If you, even if you take the spaghetti westerns, you know, you, you take oh, yeah. uh, the uh, the most uh, important one is obviously the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Once yeah. upon a time in the West, that it's just two hundred two two between two three three and a half hours, but. Uh, even like you know, the most the, the more obscure uh, Sergio Corbucci movies would actually like uh, um, oh I forgot that Western in the Snow I forgot the name exactly it's the Silence whatever and it's actually pretty long you have all these movies that that represented really such a such a strong personality when it comes to cinema it forged nowadays uh, plans and and compositions to the to to an insane extent and these were not action movies you're right they were movies. That's all movies. Then you had action because action serves a purpose when it comes yeah. to that. It's not action for the sake of it, like 70% of what's going on in the movie industry. And I'm being kind here. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. It's it, it, it was all more sto story driven for sure. Um, story was, was the element. And I, you know, I like there's this book that I've read many times. It's called um, Visual Story by Bruce Block. It's basically a breakdown of a cinematography, but in a way like how filmmakers and, you know, from the from the school of filmmaking, from the Russian school of filmmaking through the early Hollywood, through, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, how they were scripting every single aspect of cinematography and the movie and storytelling to 
make the most impact out of it, right? So you'd have things like line drafts or, or, or line scripts, which would decide your eye movement. Just 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 to decide like where your eye is going to move during the movie. You know, if if there was a dramatic scene, a dramatic conversation between two people, you would have a, a, a you know, under the the storyboard, you would have another block which would have like a long vertical line or long horizontal line, which would mean that your eye is gonna drift from you know one one part of the screen to another, which which is like you know, you're you're moving your head back and forth, back and forth. It, it feels dramatic to you, just just the fact that you're moving your head, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so they would do those kind of scripts to not only engage you from the story point of view, but also you know from visual and emotional point of view. And I think that craft that it used to be like how the movies were used to be done, I think it's gone. It's it's not there in a lot of movies. I, I work on a lot of movies, and I, I I see it every now and then, but not as often as I would like to see it, you know, so. Sometimes you have guys like the, some of the newcomers but <clears throat> that have been like confirmed as great filmmakers like Duncan Jones. And, but Duncan Jones is a bit of an exception, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, the guy who did Moon and oh, uh, yeah, yeah, Source, of course. Uh, Source Code. It's just so, you know, that's that's great cinema where action is just having the right amount of of logic, you know. Yeah. But it's again not being driven by action all the time, and it's just I I would dream being able to uh, see more movies like this. Hence why Blade Runner is having so much interest, and and it's just like kind of fascinating, fascinating in in its own way. It's uh, it's really having a lot of pluses, yeah. and that's an amazing uh, statement already from uh, Villeneuve. To be honest, it's really good. So we went a little bit of uh, outside of the script. We were talking yeah. about your uprising a little bit, and then we went to Blade Runner right away. Um, I wanted to ask you, I asked this question um, to many people that I have a conversation with, is what what got you into this industry? Like, w- was there any moment that you had in your life that was really inspiring where you felt like, oh, I want to be an artist? Uh, and was it was it that you, you knew or you've learned quickly that there's an industry or it's something that came in later on for you? No, what happened is that, uh, so first of all, when I was like 16 or something, I remember my, 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 my school, uh, my art teacher telling me, you will do the art deco school. There's no other way. That's what you'll do. Which for me seemed so far away. That what was like in, uh, 1986 or 1987, mm-hmm. you know? And then after that, after, uh, you know, uh, preparatory school in Paris, I ended up just like uh, succeeding at having the Art Deco School and, Oli- and Olivier de Serre and during the first year, which was pretty rare. I was kind of proud of that. But I was working my ass off. I was really right. like, working like crazy. Uh, I did the full year where I was just like walking nonstop all the time, night and day. And it paid off. I actually had uh, the, uh, the Art Deco School the first year. So right. it kind of really installed me into art for good uh and that was like a great first step um but uh apart from that when it comes to the professional side my my first uh my first work was done in 1990 and i was actually doing uh doing uh um illustri- um pen and paper and pencil illustration mm-hmm. For uh, for a scientific magazine at that time, and it was and at that point it just went on the cover at one point, which was really like I was super proud of it. I was like what nineteen, and which seemed already pretty late when you look at the whole thing. But that's because back in the days, I think I'm actually kind of a late comer when it comes to art and all that. What I mean is that I hire people that are actually in their twenties. Uh, me in my twenties, I would guess I was super crappy in, into what I was doing. I think I was good at some <laughs> things, but we when you compare <laughs> the industry standards, it's insane how everything went straight up in many ways. You know. Anyway, yeah. all this to say, I ended up uh, um, uh, going into uh, illustration, and I was convinced I was going to end up doing book illustration at one point. It's the thing that I was like really liking, and I was already doing some illustrations for some some. Uh, some sort of not professional, but for for you right. know, tests and all. Uh, and what happened is that very fast I was caught up into 
uh, the multimedia industry as soon as 1995, actually, after a few years of study. Back in 1995, it was, this is the pre-internet era, you know, like in France, uh, internet arrived like truly into companies around 1997, right. 1996 for the lucky ones, 1997 for like the, the later ones. So that's where you started having internet, you know, like a thing that you could use. And, yeah, I think uh, it was the same for Poland, um, yeah, maybe a like, year later or something like that. But I remember like up until 2000, I, did, I didn't even have internet at home. Oh, yeah. I knew some people that I had. It was like, oh, you're my best friend now because you have internet. <laughs> exactly. uh, <laughs> so I went through all the multimedia era. And, uh, you know, that the multimedia thing when it comes to uh, the, you know, the software, I mean, like the uh, these things you had into your living room and all that stuff, all that stuff kind of crumbled and just like collapsed. Yeah. And uh, I naturally went into video games. Uh, my I, I was uh, I've always been a friend with uh, since the early 2000, actually, with Mathieu Lofre, because he was at the Art Disco School. And you know that for a while, Mathieu was actually with uh, Claire Wendling back in the early 1990s. Uh, and as a result, uh, with with them, with also uh, Denis, my friend Dodi Bajram, uh, and with some other uh, comic book artists back in Paris, mm -hmm. we were all hanging out and playing Doom Doom in, uh, in, in two, <laughs> the studio back in 1993. And that's at that same time, around 1994, Claire was sometimes hanging in the studio and just like, doing sketches and just like being like this and going on a sofa and, and sketching on a sheet at the same time because right. she's like only badger style doesn't she doesn't give a fuck <laughs> so amazing so that's what that that was the mood of the thing you know that's what we we were living in the middle of pass uh Matthew studio was just like down the street you know it was easy to always hang out together and just have fun and talk about art uh so after a while he actually introduced me to a friend of his uh called uh, Guillaume uh, Gouraud, and they had a small uh, studio uh, uh, called, uh, first of all, it was actually called LCD Multimedia, I think. And then it changed name to Verity Inc., uh, Verity Interactive, sorry. And after after that, it became Dark Work Studio back uh, around 1997. And I started, like, as a contractor, uh, and very in a few months, I ended up just being totally full-time uh, because I was always working for them, and then I became like a full-time employee for them around 2000. Uh, stayed in that company for six years. Did all the artworks back in, uh, we started in 1998. After a few prototypes, we worked on uh, Alone in the Dark 4. Yeah, that's why, I, that's why I that's got to know what your work for the first time. When I saw like the making of, you were in the video, and you were talking about concept art. And I remember seeing you doing sketches on the video, it was like VHS tape, by the way. Oh my like, God. Well, what? <laughs> <laughs> that was so cool. Anyway, yeah, sorry I interrupted you. It's, oh no, it's all good. Don't worry. But that's that's how I ended up into concept. But the the funny detail is, back in 1998 or 1997, nobody was called concept artist. It was not right. even a term. You were called illustrator. That that's what you were, illustrator. Either you were a comic book artist. Or you were an illustrator, and illustrators were providing ideas for the uh, video game industry. Yeah. That's what's going on. The the concept artist thing was not even a name. Concept designer maybe a bit, but most of the time you were not using these names. You know, people were not even knowing what it went, what it meant at all. Yeah. So it's kind of funny. You know. When do you think it was invented? I mean, it definitely was invented by video games industry. Oh, I think um, it did. Definitely. I mean, we could yeah. look at the etymology of the word and, and historically and all. I know that back in uh, 1998, we were not using that term at all. We were just like saying illustrators. Yeah. In film, then, it's very rare. Uh, You're going get, to gonna get like a concept artist title. I mean, these days, it's more off. It's more apparent, like it's happening more often. But up until like last, maybe like even two or three years ago, 95% of the films would be you would be just illustrator, just yeah. purely yeah. illustrator. Yeah, it's interesting. And uh, just another great moment. You know, it's I've always been having a bit of a career where you can find great moments that happened. And mm -hmm. most of the time, it's great encounters. And that's the really interesting bit, uh, to be honest. It really proves right. something for people that really want to be artists and succeeding into the industry. It's about really... Uh, 
finding people that can either be uh, mentors, but mentors is a bit of a condescending term sometimes. So uh, it's not really mentors. It's more like talking about art, working with the people that really have uh, something viable to give. You know. Mm -hmm. And what happened is that back in 2000, uh, 1999, actually, I was uh, so I was a lead on um, a lead illustrator or whatever the name <laughs> for <laughs> Lonely in the Dark Fall. We were just a few people at first, and we turned out being around like 60 to 65 back in 2001 for the release of the game. Right. And back in 1999, we had to create all these designs and all these concepts, um, and we hired two people. And two people that uh, became very close friends and that uh, I really appreciate a lot. The first person was Benjamin Carré, who actually became a very successful uh, uh, cover artist, uh, comic book artist also in his spare time. And the second person is uh, Bengal. So, oh yeah, Bengal. Uh, Fucking and, fuck uh, that guy, man. He's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Bengal was like 19 or something. I mean, put that into the context of like 19, or maybe not 19, but 21, 22. I mean, he was super young, you know. Yeah, um, another another legend, dude. I remember his work from Sejan as well. Holy oh, shit! Yeah, and we. I, I'm always when I think about Bengal and Benj, I can really say first of all, uh, Benj, uh like kicked my butt for me to just like go more into computers because I re, I I, re, I had my Power Mac whatever, and I had mm -hmm. a small tablet, but every time I was neglecting it and was like, I don't really care about it. <laughs> I want to hear paper. Uh, with um, uh, with uh, with just like marker and all that stuff. Actually, you know what? If I find my book, I was gonna take my book and show you a few pages on it. I think it's in the other room. I need, I'll need to find it. But in that book, I have uh, like all my black and white stuff that I was doing prior to two to two thousand or nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. And Benjamin actually really encouraged me to just go into that and say. You gotta take a computer and test that shit because it's insane. And it, I it took me like uh, years and years. The first time I was using a tablet, a tablet at the Art Deco School in 1993, I was using the smudge tool to just like smudge a stupid circle shape <laughs> and telling myself, "This is shit. I'm never gonna make <laughs> any of that stuff really successful. It's always I I don't feel the hang of the whole thing, and it's just like really pretty bad." And then I give it a try again, and it again and again. Uh, so many times, but it's really thanks to these guys uh, that I could really take off. And they took off at the same time. We all took off at the same time, and we all discovered a shitload amount of things in a span of just like two years. Yeah. Uh, remember the excitement of finding Japanese artists online uh, back in 1999, where basically we knew nothing about all these 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 dudes. And we were just like finding all these guys that were doing that like, digital art, all like all full paint. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. You know, it helped yeah. us a lot. And I'm always saying, I think I really started being good at, at car back in 2000, truly, or 2000. <clears throat> this and obviously the other name is um, Sijun. And Sijun had obviously a huge influence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I discovered it in 2003, I think. Yep. And yep. that's where it all started. <laughs> I yep. had some forums that I used before. I mean, I grew up on forums. Like, I literally learned everything that I know on forums. That's so fucking uh, crazy. I regret the death of forums, of most of them. I think yeah, it's, I miss uh, it too, man. Yeah. I miss it too. Uh, Season was such a magical place because... You had, uh, I mean, even uh, I mean, outside of the sketch, uh, the speed painting um, forum, there was not that much going on. But still, like, y y you were making a lot of connections with people over there because the most conversations would happen through art. Like, you literally could only post if you drew, drew something and you didn't want to drew shit because nobody would talk with you. So people would try to, to paint the best shit they can paint and do those sketches just to have a conversation. That was so so much fun, dude. To finish about the career side, I think there was another great encounter back in uh, two, 2005 where we were working on Prince of Persia and then on Assassin's Creed. Uh, with Thierry Doison, we were the first two concept artists being put on Assassin's Creed when they had nothing, just an idea on paper. Right. And so we started working on everything from uh, the environment to even the costume and all that stuff. 
And that was back in 2000, end of 2004, early 2005. And that was another great moment because at the same time, we had so many breakthrough when it comes to brushes, when it comes to all these techniques we wanted to just be perfecting. And I think that back in the days, you really had a more <laughs> conventional approach to art making and, and digital art, which was you take your brown, brown brush and you make everything with just like one, two, or three <laughs> brushes. And with David, my friend David, but also Thierry Doison, but you had quite a few guys with us, you know, uh, we were like, why, why should we just do this? Why don't we try to break the canvas in multiple angles? Why don't we try to just like break everything before reconstructing, you know? So yeah. it ended up having all these brush techniques, huge brushes where we were going to the max of what Photoshop would allow us on the on the brush side, and using you know different pacing and different like brush parameters, the draw brush system, we could find insane results and obtain insane things that were leaning abstract but also super interesting to just like block out the painting, and that stuff was really kind of. I remember jumping up and down uh, at finding these techniques with David. So we ended up saying like, okay, we need to talk about this, but it was a bit like we have find something insane, you know? <laughs> and uh, David was, uh, we, we kind of agreed. We said, uh, David wanted to just do a Gnome on DVD. That's what he did a few years afterwards where he spoke about all these techniques. And I did a book, the first one back in 2008, but I started way earlier than that. Uh, and to just show a bit of all these techniques through artworks and all that stuff. So we felt we could just like show a bit of all these small dis discoveries. But when you put that back in the days, I mean, we had literally nobody or not many people that would help us define the shit, you know. And it's the same thing in the 1990s. It was even worse. You literally had nothing. I mean, I'm going to put you back into context. The first time I saw an image by Craig Mullins back in 1994, it was for the marathon game. And Craig Mullins was already working with Bungie uh, for the marathon game one and two. I think it was 1994, 1995. And the it was first time. with mouse, right? Back then. So, he, like, partly, I guess he still was. And that stuff, when you look at that first image, we could maybe find it online. We could just like do a bit of a search. That image back in 1994 was groundbreaking. It was shaking our mental foundations because <laughs> we had no fucking idea how we had done it. What yeah. I mean is the, I, the simple idea of just mentioning digital art was not even something. We knew there was a bit of that, but it was like mystical shit. We were just not knowing at all yeah. what we could have done that on a computer. That's where we were, and he, that's, that shows you how much he had defined in advance since the early Photoshop days. And I, and I remember we were still trying to depict the whole thing and understand, and that, that's like back in 2000, uh, 1994. You know? Yeah. No, he, so was, a, he was a true, true godfather of, um, true godfather of uh, concept art, man. Like, oh yeah, and yeah. and digital art, like for reals. He, he's just like, oh my god, this guy. And then it's you have the other guy. Insane, man. I just received that uh, an hour ago, so that's pretty good. <laughs> oh yeah, of course, it mead. <laughs> it's a good. It's a good book. It's interesting. Does, you uh, don't does have to say that name. Everyone that, uh, should know it. Anyone who doesn't know Sid Mead or Craig Mullins, go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's another uh, good moment where I had a bit of a freak out back in 2006 because. Um, no one had asked me to do a, a like a two hour demo of my of, of you know the brush techniques back in two thousand six and it was just during that same era with yeah. David and we and I did that demo and during the day so you had uh, Craig, uh, not Craig Mullins um, uh, Sid Mead for two hours of Sid Mead explaining his techniques and his painting process and then I was just gonna come in just straight afterwards <laughs> and so I mean. <laughs> Like, yeah, you, you know, told me that story on THU, but yeah, continue. It's, no, it's a good one. That you're going to be uh, spending two hours explaining your digital crap after, <laughs> after Sid Mead is just, it, it's just kind of, um, you know, overwhelming and, and, and a bit stressful. And it went really fine, you know, but it's still uh, something that I keep and I'm super proud having done this. It's just that it was kind of a stressful moment for sure. You know? It's like it's like you're you're aspiring comedian and, and you have your first open mic in the comedy store or something <laughs> or like in the comedy place 
And yeah, you're it's a bit like to... when you were a stand-up comedian, and uh, the first person in front of you in the public is Jerry Seinfeld, you know. It's yeah, like, or Dave Chappelle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, okay, well, I'm going to do my shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just bombing, <laughs> bombing like hell. Yeah, it's so funny, dude. When you told me, I was laughing so hard. It was it's such a fucking bad luck. Like, oh my god, like what the fuck you guys are doing? Why you're putting me behind the legend, like right after a legend. Fuck you guys. Yep. Yep. <laughs> oh, so uh, message, I was telling you about a video. Uh so you know, sometimes I do these gun modes. Do you want me to just launch that thing? Yeah, that, just play it. Let's, let's play. You you've been recording something, so uh your painting process. So let's just have it play. Um, okay. So, so there's, there's something yeah. moving on the screen. There's a bunch of questions that came in. I mean, we'll, we'll probably well, only I... watch a part of the video, but uh, I'll read the questions a little later. But um, <coughs> but yeah, <coughs> yeah, man. Siegen forums was was something. I, I remember I, I, that's how I discovered you. Um, or actually, no, I I I've seen your work as I said on that on that tape uh, from Alone in the Dark, and then afterward like soon after uh, Wait, yeah, um, there was a video about alone in the dark my gosh that's uh, making off of the of the, oh, of the right. video oh, game that, that, that's vintage i would really like to see this <laughs> yeah it was like four by three format and vhs <laughs> like it looked like those old mar martial arts movies <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> uh yeah good good old shit man it was it was but it was like interesting to watch like the first thing that made me aware of the of the industry, I've said this story many times, but in 2003, there was uh, this short film made by a Polish guy, Tomek Baginski. He's uh, he's one of the main guys over at Platish Image in Warsaw. Uh, mm. The guys who are doing like the the Witcher cinematics, and they've been doing like a lot of shit these oh, days. Oh yeah, we worked with them on, uh, if I remember correctly, we worked with them on Halo 5 not long ago. They did some of the cinematics for Halo 5, I yeah, think. Yeah, there you go. Yep, yep. So the one of the main guys uh, over there, Tomek Baginski, um, yeah, he, so uh, he made that short film, and it, there was a making of a national TV, and I was like, holy shit, you can actually, I, I saw like a studio with people sitting behind the computers, and like, oh, it looks like they're actually working, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> this is actual work, you can actually work in this industry, so that was the first time I have discovered you can do that. And then afterwards, I started like researching. So I, I would go to like the internet cafes because I didn't have internet at home. I would spend all of my money that I was making as a janitor first to go to the internet cafes and um, spend time like searching uh, forums and all that stuff. And then that's how I discovered Seijin. I remember first couple of images I posted on Seijin was from internet cafe because I didn't even have internet. I would just I would just save that shit on the floppy disks or <laughs> uh, or um or CDs and then go go like and post from there. It was so crazy, but I remember well, no, like we were saying in uh, in THU. I think that when it comes to uh, the way you make art today and and is I think that defines you and that defines the. The, the type of anger you should have been feeling when it comes to to that, you know, and I think that's that's visible through your your art in a way. And yeah. uh, it's 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 my turn to just like, you know, throw flowers a bit. Uh, your stuff has been mind blowing uh, during these last years. And, and it's uh, it, it's just the way Thanks, you run mostly into uh, black and white sketches when it comes to uh uh, that that the uh, you know the women series that you've been doing right uh, right I find that mind blowing and I'm like how the heck do you can can you just like find the versatility uh, to just be doing something that different and that professional at the same time just just wanted to just throw that there because it's uh, it's it's Thanks, really man. I, I appreciate that a lot especially hearing from you motherfucker ah <laughs> 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 uh, yeah man. Uh, I don't know. It's like, I guess, uh, you know, like looking back at Seijin times and and all the years that I've spent and you as well. I mean, how many years you've been in the industry? For God's sakes, you've been like 20 years longer than I did, I think. You've been working uh, when I was shitting my diapers. So <laughs> that kind of puts, puts things in perspective. Um, but I think like when you have 
I start to I I always change my mind in terms of like how you acquire skills and and what really matters. I mean, these days you have those twenty year old kids that are amazing technically, right? But there is always there there might be some savants here and there that are just fucking outperforming everyone, and you're just thinking like, how what the hell am I doing, right? Because this twenty yeah. year old kid is just about to blow up. Um, but most of the kids that are really good technically, they're still missing. They're they're still having those rough edges, those uh, those places where it lacks in the design, or maybe the composition sense is not that great, or choice I of totally lighting. Agree. I agree. I think that when it comes to design specifically, uh, having a strong design sense is very different than image making. Yeah, image making yeah. is is a talent. It's a knowledge, and it's very hard. Uh, <clears throat> design and the design sense, which is design balance, uh, using the right rhythmical uh, elements, the right values, understanding how to use the raw of thirds as well as uh, the raw of odds into design, into yeah. pace, and having the right pacing. This is something that can take a lifetime. Some people are super fast at understanding this. Some people are not. Some people never understand it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a bit of a, that, that weird box that you have to open. And sometimes people are struggling to do it. But I guess that, again, for the people, again, you know, and we've had these discussions before, but when it comes to uh, talent, uh, it's also in insane hard work. And after a while, uh, you can open that door. And yeah, it's true. Yeah. That, um, it's, it's pretty <clears throat> tough. Yeah, it's a lot of practice. It's a lot of like not only artistic practice, but just general understanding of the world and experience you have in life, like different kinds of experiences that you endure, you know, whether you're traveling or having hobbies that open up your mind to specific things or even experiencing just life in general and learning from that, right? That's that's what opens up your understanding of life and the more you understand the more you can apply that knowledge to make better decisions in, in your artistic uh, decisions as well, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. I, I've, noticed, I've noticed that specifically by... Because I have a very... Like, I have a nature where if something interests me, I'll, I'll go zero to 100 with it. Like, I will just absolutely lose my mind in doing that, right? You can ask every every single person that knows me really well. And I, I always do that. Like when the moment I started thinking about podcasting and, you know, uh, having any kind of setup for podcast, I wouldn't, you know, I could buy a headset with just like fucking re regular microphone. No, that's not for me. I've spent like fucking weeks browsing <laughs> forums, r r trying to figure out who's doing what and what's the best equipment and fucking spending hundreds of dollars to get the lighting set up and everything. Things that have. I'm pretty sure a lot of people don't give a fuck about. <laughs> um, no, but uh, it it shows a dedicated spirit, you know, and, and yeah. that makes it done also. You know, sometimes you gotta be full. You gotta be like really, um, very, um, very dedicated. You know. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm afraid of playing video games. I get really addicted doing that. Like I, I, I don't, I. I want to play it like if I if I find a game that I enjoy a lot, I'll play yeah. it to fucking be the best at it. Like not just to be having fun, you know, just to fucking kick ass. <laughs> you, okay. you know, it's yeah, like yeah. I have this kind of weird obsession that sometimes I don't know. It's like it might be a little bit of the addictive, um, like a different kind of addiction where it just um, emanates in, 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 in different areas. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I, but yeah, I agree with you. That's the design is something that you might learn. You may may not. If it's if you, if it's taking you a lot of time, that means you're not spending enough time. Um, you know, it's a lot of practice and and knowing life. I agree with that. But 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 coming back to, um, you know, the generation of uh, younger artists and how easy it is to get to become an artist and you know. When you look at those younger guys, again, like unless they are savants, like there are some people that you're, they're just mind blowing what they are doing at, at such a young age. But yeah, there's a rough edges that just come come with time, and you need to put that that time in. Otherwise, it's not gonna happen. Um, but yeah, it's like it's it's it was different times when you were there, like when you were learning and I was learning. Um, like, I, I feel there's a bit of an uh, <clears throat> unfair situation sometimes, which is I'm, <laughs> I'm saying that uh, with a, and I'm like 
really joking about it, to be honest. But it is a fact that um, when you look at um, when you look at today, uh, everything is just so fast paced in terms of yeah. uh, techniques that the techniques can be shared so fast. Yeah, uh, everything is just like instantaneous. If a, if a, a newcomer to art wants to understand Photoshop, he's going to have a full access to like hundreds, thousands of videos that will explain things that will just have multiple point of views where he can just like be doing his with a very supermarket attitude, finding yeah. what he wants and being able to just like find his own art personality and all that goes with it. Back in the days, we had literally nothing. We had nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it means that zero. All the- we had to do everything by ourselves. We had to to paint by ourselves. We had to be uh, defining what what it meant to actually just like uh, find, find like more groundbreaking ways of using Photoshop, and all that was just like we did that by ourselves, you know. And that's yeah. that stuff. <clears throat> Sorry. Today, yeah, it's uh, it's I'm saying always it's, it's kind of unfair because we were having zero community or just. Not it a lot. Longer, way longer. Exactly. And everything is just so fast paced. I would even say that to learn a new technique, we needed months back in the in the early two thousands. Today you see the younger generation being able to go five to ten times faster than we did. Yeah, so, you can learn things in days, like literally in days. Maybe it has to do with the expansion of the universe, and maybe we're all not seeing that we're all like contracting or, extra, or just like becoming. <laughs> but you see what I mean? There, there might be a pace that is different. It's clearly something that I find kind of striking. You know? Yeah, life. I mean, I have this conversation with my family a lot. It's like the life became all of a sudden in past 15, 20 years, like the pace of life. Um, unless you you deliberately steer yourself away from that pace, it became like crazy, like oh, really, yeah. really, really crazy. Especially if you live in the city, cities cities are becoming overcrowded really fast. Like I'm saying, really fast. I remember moving into Santa Monica. Um, I don't live there anymore, by the way. But I, I used to be there. I moved there in 2010. That's mm. barely what seven years yep. ago. <clears throat> yep. That was a completely different city. Like, holy shit, how different it was! It was like it felt like a beach city. It felt like a, a nice place to be. Uh, it was crowded at times, especially during the season. You would have a lot of tourists, and you would have some traffic, especially like near the pier. But yeah. but generally speaking, it was a, it was like a really nice place um, overall. It was like very it, it, it was it was not super slow pace, but it wasn't crazy. Today, it's fucking insane, dude. It feels like Tokyo. It it <laughs> literally feels like Tokyo. It's just insane. There's so many people, so many cars. I think I had that epiphany. That I had that moment where I knew I have to move out. Where I literally had. 50 feet or 100 feet oh maybe maybe 100 is uh yeah around 200 feet walking distance to 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 uh starbucks fucking 200 feet to starbucks it took me half an hour on average to get a coffee (laughs) no i mean that's fucking insane dude i guess i'm just getting old because (laughs) i don't know how some of the younger guys do it when it comes to la when it comes to california as a wall now it just became insane even san francisco you know, but we hire people that are actually trying to extract themselves out of San Francisco, the barrier, or even sometimes also Los Angeles. And uh, right. some of uh, some of these guys are just exhausted to live in that city. And yeah. I really don't want to be bitching against LA because you have it's so it's so cosmo. You just have so many things going on. Yeah, it's huge. You know, so you probably have a lot of uh, hidden secrets. Uh, and, and good and bad, but when it comes to yeah, LA, it's a mix of everything. It's it's a great place for having everything like right at your fingertips. To go, oh, holy shit! It's the best place to be because everything exactly. is here. Exactly, you know, people that really are very dedicated in their careers. It really makes sense being in such a place. Yeah. I know that after. I mean, I mean, I decided to just not go there because I was not ready to uh, uh, throw my family into the mix here when it comes to. Uh, walking in LA, walking in uh, either Glendale, you know, uh, I interviewed at DreamWorks back in 2008, you know, 
and I was <laughs> very tempted at joining them uh, when they yeah. were on production of uh, How to Train Your Dragon and all that stuff. And I kind of uh, declined because I felt it was going to be uh, a nightmare on the family side, and I really w was not wanting to 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 lose the you know the balance of uh, of a family versus work. And I think that this was going to break the whole thing. That's why I ended up actually after Texas, I ended up like accepting in uh, in Seattle, uh, working on the uh, on the Hero franchise since uh, the end of two thousand eight, early two thousand nine. And uh, and having zero regrets, and every time it's true, I had from uh, you know uh, Darren Guilford or Arthur Max and Ridley Scott wanting me to just like come come south, and I I all I always said no, and uh, I, I I I hope I'm never going to regret it one day. But at the same time, <laughs> I think my regret is at zero now, to be honest, because again, it would have been impossible from a life perspective for me with a family of of, of five in total. It's just not feasible, you know. Yeah. It's a, I knew I knew what I was going to be going into, and I was like too scared of that. Yeah, but unless you're making <laughs> unless you're making a bank, uh, which rarely ever happens, you'll be working days and night. It's a fucking expensive city. A lot of people that I know, they just they just make a good living, but that's about it. Like you're not making so much they can just chill and not do not do stuff for. Oh like yeah, weeks or yeah. something like you have to work. Soft, um, was uh, going to leave, and uh, she was just telling us, "Well, we're gonna go to um, to the Bay Area. The problem is, we have if we have a million dollar house uh, here in Seattle, they were looking at houses over there, and the houses were four million dollars. Yeah, <laughs> what do you want to do when you have to buy a four million dollar house? You know." <clears throat> it's it's just like insane, you know. It's crazy. No, yeah, cr the prices are fucking crazy. And, and Bay Area is even worse than LA, and but LA is slowly changing into that. They've they've made this uh, the whole West Side area, so that includes include including uh, Santa Monica and um, Venice and um, Marina del Rey, Culver City. Like all of those places are becoming highly overcrowded in matter of like last couple of years. Like I think it's it's like three times more people in matter oh, yeah. of like five years, because uh, they they you know Google there's Google now Snapchat all of those Silicon Valley companies open up shop uh, in that place and they call it they they started calling it Silicon Beach, you know you have Silicon Valley and you can, now you're gonna have Silicon Beach, oh, and yeah, um, it's yeah it's it's crazy like Marina del Rey. I, I lived there for a year and I've moved out immediately the, the moment I saw changes because I moved in. It was, fuck, this is so nice. You know, you're right on the water. It's super chill. It's like this enclave where there's nothing going on. You can raise your family here. I mean, heck, David Levy was li living like a, a street away from me. Oh, yeah. My another way. You're right. Yeah. 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 And, um, it was really nice and ask fucking David how it changed. Like he will tell you stories, dude. He fucking oh, yeah. hated it when moving out. Um, yeah, it changed so much in a matter of like a year. It became from, from, from having like a walk on the pier and maybe seeing one or two people to fucking, is there like a farmer's market nearby or what the fuck is going like to that kind of point, right? Where yeah. you would it was would always be uh, really uh, loud, like loud, you know, people having parties and fight, inviting friends, a lot of like new housing opening, and now I've I've moved out a, a while ago. They, they're still building. They're just you know they're taking taking apart those smaller houses or buildings, and they're building those huge fucking uh, couple of stories um, apartment buildings over there. Which is gonna make the traffic absolutely insane. Absolutely, it's already bad. It's gonna be even worse in in the next couple of years. Um, saying that, uh, actually, in uh, in Seattle, it's uh, it's kind of becoming like that. And uh, in we, cities, yeah. I'm gonna say we're a bit at fault on that. We're a bit res responsible for this when it comes to Microsoft <laughs> and mo mostly also Facebook and Amazon, which is in downtown uh, Seattle. It's right. been like really transforming the city and not always in great in great terms and in, in, in a great way because yeah. it's pushing like lower income uh, outside the city so it's losing it's losing some of its spirit and that's that's a that's a real bummer because uh, obviously uh, we're all at, responsible for that you know and Amazon has been like owning the downtown now it's just insane <laughs> when you go, 
when you go in and around the Space Needle, it's just literally crazy. It's been transformed like in six, in six, seven years. It's unrecognizable. You have multiple skyscrapers that just popped up. You have uh, people with badges all over the, all over the street. It's <laughs> crazy. You know, it's insane. Yeah. So, Corporate see, America, dude. The next uh, San Francisco, maybe. You still have better uh, housing in terms of affordable housing. It's uh, it, it's it's still it's becoming insane, but less than what you can find in San Francisco, or where basically in a lot of areas you just can't buy your house at all. You know, it's just insane. No way. Like buying house in LA, fucking. If you want to <laughs> buy a house in LA and and not not have your friendly neighbor, you know, MS thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you're true. looking at the million dollars, you know. That's in property taxes, like what? That's twenty. It's twenty thousand dollars just just to pay taxes for your fucking house. That's not oh, including right. anything. So imagine how how much of your cost of living is going to be. Hundred k means nothing in LA these days. Oh yeah, it's it's just like a one bedroom shitty car salary. It it really is. Um. It, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy how it's changing. Anyways, we we could go on and on and on <laughs> on that. But um, yeah, you you're at Microsoft now, huh? Like you've been there for um, how many years now? It's gonna be. Uh, I think it's about eight years now. Oh uh, wow, that's a long I, time. I interviewed around two thousand eight, end of two thousand eight. Uh, stayed here for a bit, and then I came back with the, with my family. And uh, I think uh, I would say around January two thousand nine. So it's it's been eight years now, and loving it. And obviously, a lot going on uh, on the franchise as usual. Uh, yeah, a lot I can't really obviously talk about because it's all super secret. No, of course. Crap. <laughs> but um, it's all Halo. You know, as a franchise studio, where this is the dedication we have, and we have a lot of things to do in the future when it comes to Halo. So it's been fun, and That's we have awesome. a big team. So we have uh, quite a few concept artists. Talking about the very promising talent, we had a super cool guy, uh, of, like uh, in July, but he was also an intern with us for quite a while. Uh, his name is uh, David Adolph, and uh, you have to check his work. He's, uh, he's yeah, send really me a happy. link. Send me a link. I'll check it out. I'm, I'm a very curious analytical, about his work. Yeah, and a very analyt analytical uh, spirit uh, and, and mind when it comes to uh, concept art, and, uh, and that guy is amazing. Yeah, yeah there are some, 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 those, some of those young guys that are just amazing. That's for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's been now since 2014. I've uh, been working with uh, Dan Baker, who was in the movie industry for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And he's been amazing. And uh, it's been really fun. Yeah, we have a great time, you know, with a full team of uh, how many are we? Like six, seven, eight, nine? I forgot. Uh, we have, um, we have uh, Glenn Israel. We have uh, Josh Cow. We have so Dan Baker as a lead. Uh, we also have David Adolf. We have Daniel Chavez, the amazing. Of course, oh, yeah. uh, Sam Brown is here with us, and uh, and it's been uh, and we have Chase too also. So it's been a blast. It's been really fun. That sounds like a fucking dream team, dude. Like really cool people to work with. It's cool, you know. I really believe into having uh, people very dedicated to concept art, being able to really express themselves in concept is vital. Um, it's uh, it's 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 fun. It's really fun. Yeah, that's that's something I miss personally, like from Naughty Dog times where I would have all of those awesome dudes to work with, you know, not only just to work with and learn from those guys, but also hang out and do all the dig, dig drawings and whatnot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, the, the best time, man. When it man. comes to uh, problem solving and concept, it's, uh, it's fascinating being able to just have an outside pair of eyes that can tell you if yeah. you are going in the right direction or even advising you to maybe veer and go in, an, in another direction if necessary. Yeah, yeah. I've or just even seeing, you know, because oftentimes you have two artists working on the similar thing and you, you look at other artists' work, it's like, holy shit, he's approaching it from a completely different angle and and sometimes that angle is better than yours and you just I realize had a, that. Oh, yeah. I had a really breakthrough moment with uh, my friend uh, Gabriel Garza, Robo Gabo, who was mm -hmm. amazing. So, obviously, he's actually he's, he's been at Facebook for quite a while now. And uh, and with Gabriel, when we were working on uh, Halo 4 and Halo 5, 
uh, I remember like so many times I was like, hey game, come, come see this. What do you think if I do this? And then I was painting and he was just behind me. And in, in many occurrences, uh, very often, he would just stand there and I would actually explain to him my plan at the way I would develop that specific image. And I was going to be uh, telling him, what do you think about doing this? And I was doing it at the same time. I was you know, just like changing the U, uh, just adding shapes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I was basically uh, in a in a state of confidence because I knew he could back me up if I would, if I might say. And as a result, it was doing insane problem solving, like crazy problem solving. And at the end, without him saying much, sometimes he was not even saying anything, but. I knew that his eyes were looking at the, the right thing. And if I had been doing something stupid, stupid, he would have told me. And yeah. I, it just, it was always giving me the confidence to just like push, push it forward, for example. So it's very interesting, the sy synergy work and, and collaborative work on a piece by just having the right pair of eyes looking at what you do on a canvas is, is kind of vital. It helps a lot in many ways. Yeah. It, it's, it's just allowing breakthroughs, if I might say. No, it does. It definitely does. I had I had an opportunity to to have that at Naughty Dog, but also like more recently, I do work from home, so it's it's a little different. Uh, but but even uh, working from home, like there there were a couple of projects where I would work with Ash together. You know, like more recently on that really Scott project, I, I worked with Ash, and we collaborated. We actually worked on the same images. We would just go back and forth. And jam together like at nights and be on the Skype and have a conversation, screen sharing and just fucking, you know, um, doing like cool, creative, collaborative work. It was so much fun. Um, I definitely missed that. I was one of the, one of the parts that I miss from from being in the office, you know, like being with with the studio environment because it's just like it's just the camaraderie of of working with artists. But then again, you know, I can sit with my dick out and nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> at my home i could i could be sitting with my dick out right now too <laughs> if i wanted to nobody would know <laughs> uh, all right man uh dude it was so nice talking with you let's let's jump into uh some questions there was actually quite a bunch of them and then we can wrap right. it up what do you think go for it all right um let me quickly browse through i'll i'll try to read those that are the most interesting all right. Since um, I'm actually showing the uh, the image being done right now, I don't see the the, the questions. But that's, that's all right. I'll read them uh, okay. out loud. What kind of art influences inspired you to adopt the shape based circles and rectangles uh, illustration approach we have seen uh, for so long in your artworks? So that I think it's because I'm I'm so fascinated by primitive shapes. It's something mm -hmm. that I find vital, and that has to do with a bit of an optical approach to concept art and visuals. When I say optical approach, it has to do with the way the eyes see and are attracted by shapes and by right. primitives. If we call them primitives, it's, there's a good damn reason. Is that it's really going into the 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 most basic shapes that the eyes can see and decipher in a in in a in a super fast amount of time, and and I love doing that. I love working with shapes and having a bit of a ratio of an eighty twenty or like eighty percent real like ten, concrete tangible understandable shapes and twenty percent abstract on top. The reason is. The amount of times where, uh, you know, either friends or people that saw my images, they were always telling me, what I like about your images is that you, uh, you propose a universe and we finish, and we finish it. Right. But what they mean by this is that they were really liking the fact that the, the fact that the 15%, like not unfinished status, but the 15% the, the abstraction was allowing some viewers to finish the image by themselves. And that was yeah, something heads. very attached to. And that was kind of a discovery for me. But to go back to the primitive shapes and, and the basic shapes, <clears throat> I think it's, it's, always, it's always a question of directional shapes and lines within the canvas. Mm -hmm. A canvas, if you do everything in a super insanely illustrated way, where you do everything in the way uh, it's going to happen in, in real life, you have to still make sure, nonetheless, that your initial scene in real life you're getting inspired by 
is going to have the proper amount of leading lines, uh, volumes that will make sense and that can define a composition. Right. The ads will automatically be attracted to uh, to 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 like uh, lines, dynamic lines. We all know, you know, that diagonals are a sign of dynamic. You know, um, yeah, yeah. Vertical and and verticals is a sign of either epicness and static. Uh, horizontal is it can be just flattening things. There may be ways to just like control these lines and these primitive shapes, whether they be circles. So the, the circle and the concentric nature of a circle is super attracting to the eye. If you look at it, it's like an it's like an an, an eyeball. That's what it is. It's yeah. like it's like mimicking a pupil. You know, it feels very serene too. Like you know, if you draw all of your uh, if you draw a lot of circles in your in your image, it's gonna feel like sort of like almost cloudy in a way. Exactly. Uh, right. So I've always been attracted yeah. to this, and on top of that, I really think it has to do with the using your shape language in the same way you would use uh, a vocabulary. I think that the fact that my vocabulary is also composed of primitive shapes that I play with is something I'm very attached to, and I love playing with these shapes. I find it way more interesting because it's like playing with a puzzle. It's like playing with a set of puzzle pieces, and that's yeah. vital. Uh, art is about playing too. It's like a game, you know. And expressing that through art is super fun. That's why I love experimental techniques because it's the same thing as if we were playing Monopoly or any type of funky games that actually is going on right now. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, I agree with you. That's a that's a very very interesting approach um, to the subject for sure. For sure. All right. Let me uh, let me read another question. Second one. Okay. It's it's a little related, I think. Uh, what do you think are the most important qualities skills to practice as a student, apart from obvious art skills, etc.? Well, uh, for this, I'm going to be very straightforward. I think that um, the best. You're going to say foundation. <laughs> well, foundation. Obviously, foundation is important, but. Uh, I think that even prior to foundation is why do you create in the first place and what is the yeah. nature of what you create? Why do you do it? I really believe that uh, a lot of artists, and this is why, Massiage, when you were talking about, you know, the conversations we had about porn and even what you said in your talk when it comes to the THU talk that you did, mm -hmm. uh, I would emphasize that at the very beginning, even before like having a process of creation, what is important is maybe to understand why do we create in the first place and what, is, what are the broken parts within us that are actually pushing us to create in the first place. Yeah. I don't want to go into saying that each, oh, fuck it, I'm going to say it anyway. I think <laughs> that <laughs> all artists uh, have something, a, a little bit of them broken inside. Yeah, uh, I would agree with that. that. Exactly. Uh, like... It's, and it doesn't need to be really taking shape of a, of, a, of a huge, heavy trauma. That's not what I mean. But there are reasons why we create in the first place. And this, I think, is as vital as uh, the fact of becoming a better artist. It's also knowing why you create. It's not how. It's also why. And why are you attracted to art in the first place? Uh, and uh, that's vital. I think probably the best artists and the most dedicated artists are the ones that have a purpose as to why they create. Uh, for my case, uh, it's kind of abstract, but yes, I I am like many artists and many human beings. I am fascinated by uh, by 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 life and death. I guess that there's a part of me that wants to be doing things uh, here on Earth before I just go away. Uh, it's not that I want to be uh, either going into any type of star system or becoming famous or whatever. It's not what I mean. It's more yeah. a, a, a deeper question inside that we have about about saying why do we create and and having that recognition towards friends and maybe also peer artists or even people you don't know you know and that's yeah. super vital it's the thing that makes you move forward uh it's also having that recognition and why why would you want to show your work i remember always a sentence that my friend benjamin carrie was always saying like 15 uh, like more than 15 years ago uh when we told him, like, why do you create and, 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 and what do you like in art and why do you do what you do now as an artist? He was always telling them, me in French, one sentence. And for the French speakers here and for the people that can understand it, it's always a funny sentence. But he was saying, moi, tout ce que je veux, c'est qu'on m'aime. 
Meaning, what does it mean? It means the only thing I want is people to love me. <laughs> and it, it was always saying that with a bit of a funny, uh, funny voice, uh, funny, gentle voice, like saying, it's obvious, you know, the only thing I want is just, just people loving me. That's really all. That's all there is to it, you know. Right. And it might be connected to that. It's like you just really want to receive some love and receive maybe some recognition when it comes to the cool shit you do. And it might not be more complex than this, you know. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you 100%. There's always a reason why you create. And I had this quote in my talk uh, that I've taken from Jordan Peterson, uh, which is basically, if, if you're going to be creative, it's because you're tormented by a problem. And your problem might be the fact that you need to be loved, you know, like you need have that need to be admired or you have that need that every, at least something you create someone will be appreciating the effort you're putting in and some and oftentimes it it all it might spur from uh from your childhood you know maybe you had parents that didn't give you enough love or didn't say a nice word to you when you created something interesting you know definitely that uh, might be that might be one that. of the reasons so Exactly. And sometimes it's a bit more uh, like hidden or insidious or something that is just not really blatantly readable. It right. might just be that you can either be a, a, tor a tormented person without going into the cliche of the uh, of the, de de you know, the de depressed artist or whatever. That's not <laughs> what But it's more like how do you construct and build yourself as an artist? And yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, these are important questions. But to go back to the question here, it's really... Um, as important uh, as uh, as the why, uh, how you're going to create it's it's the it's the why in the first place. And maybe if you do a bit of introversion about on that, it's going to be super insightful as an artist. <laughs> Always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there is. I mean, this is this subject alone could be a conversation on its own. You know, we could go on and on. Like have an absolutely second podcast about this, just this subject. <laughs> well, it's I just believe. planned that for a few months. Uh, like, count me in. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we should do a uh, number two. Uh, well, right. that came out wrong. <laughs> we should do number two. That came out wrong. We should do uh, one more podcast in the future for sure. <laughs> um, let me see. I'll maybe go with one more question. There's so many. I'm um, sorry, guys. So we're just you know um i can go I, faster into answering questions <laughs> you want to rapid fire through few all right let's go with a rapid fire for a while all right let's see uh what is your thinking process when it comes to choosing colors uh complementary tones uh you got to organize your complementary tones to smart layering of a few layers uh in in different modes uh that's the way i do <clears throat> then you can invent your own your own process when it comes to the way you define color tones and the way you use cars. But most of the time, what prevails is understanding how cars are resonating mm -hmm. one compared to the other through a smart use of complementary tones. Complementary, and like, as you, uh, as you may guess, uh, I'm talking <laughs> to, the, to the, the, the person that is actually answering the question here, asking the question is uh, red versus, um, versus green, yeah. Uh, um, orange versus blue and whatever the next one. But uh, yeah. it, it becomes instinctive after a while. You use cars as a dynamic tool that will have different areas of your canvas pop or just like be subdued depending on the amount of tone and cars you put in. But complementary tone is the most vital principle when it comes to car making, definitely. Uh, which artists inspired you the most? Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, <laughs> I would, I would still say that uh, the easiness or the, the how easy John Burke does things is obviously something that I find fascinating. There's a myriad of artists, you know. There's just so many of them. It's just hard to just give a bit of a list. Doesn't make a lot of sense too, because you know, one day you're going to look at one artist, another day you're going to look at another one. Uh, Craig Mullins has been amazing, even though. I don't, I, I mean, I, I find Craig Mullins a great image maker. That <laughs> does not always make him a great designer. He's a fascinating image maker. And that's, that, and these are two different things. A good designer uh, is, it's, it's really different. I think that in many ways, Sid Mead is an amazing designer yeah. uh, and an amazing image maker, you know. So we always have a bit of the one attribute of both, of both talents. 
uh, obviously John Burke, when it comes to design and shape language, was kind of amazing, even though kind of redundant into his style. But at the same time, he was not needing to re reinvent himself too much. And he had, you know, like such a great career. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. It's like Kubrick and cinematography or um, Otomo yeah. and storytelling and masterful fucking Find fascinating art. recipes. You use the recipes and you make entire universes with these same recipes. And it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the ideal route for someone who aspires to be successful in concept design for games, training and school? Uh, that's a tough question because that depends the level that that person is having. Uh, obviously, at the very, very beginning, the best is to go online, uh, find what you like, uh, and obviously uh, subscribe to courses that will just make a lot of sense when it comes to specific schools. I'm 46 years old now, and I'm kind of like very detached of the full school system when it comes to digital <laughs> arts and games and dev, you know. It's, it's yeah. kind of crazy when it comes to the student aspect. Obviously, I'm surrounded by deaf people and by concept artists, so on that side, uh, nothing is new, but when it comes to the education system and the way we teach art today, I'm too disconnected to be really uh, giving any advice. Um, though I don't think we should neglect uh, academic arts training, the fact of going into doing nude models, uh, understanding perspective, and any type of foundation is vital, super vital. And I will even say that very often, the best the best artists are the ones that have received academic knowledge and academic training and traditional techniques and that have been good into traditional techniques from acrylics to oils to uh, marker paper and marker uh, pencil and anything that you can just like scribble on a on a real paper. And these people are often the the, the most talented ones. So you should yeah. never neglect all the traditional. Painting techniques. That's a short fact. Or sign up for Learn Squared. Boom. Your problem solved. All right. I'm going to read one last one. This one is interesting. I, I'm pretty sure you have your thoughts, and I, I'll add mine and we'll wrap it up. Uh, can someone from the third world country uh, can get also to in the mainstream art industry, like working from home and working in the studio? Um, definitely, definitely. Yeah. I think it's it's. There should never be ever any boundaries to uh, the fact of achieving a career into concept or into even movies. And there's been quite a few examples of people living in in countries where things are way more complicated from a political standpoint, uh, from an accessibility standpoint to like uh, you know even like modern technologies or even internet. Yeah, uh, that should never be detrimental to a career. It will be more difficult. That's a sure fact. And we spoke a oh, lot yeah, about like and ten and we have more difficult for sure. Like even what Matthew, you were saying, which is uh, we are not all equal when it comes to uh, to the 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 act of, of going into a career and succeeding. We're not all equal uh, because of where we are located, because where we live, because what we what, what because of the language we speak. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, uh, dedication and people really wanting to be succeeding into art, I really agree that there's, there's always a way to make that work. It can be insane as fuck and it can be super complex, but it's doable even for people that have less access to technologies or the easy options of living in the US or in Europe. Yeah. It's still something. Look at Jama, for example, and these guys. I mean, some of these guys have been living in, 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 uh, in like really... Uh, some remote is, yeah world. Tajikistan it's like fucking it's like Afghanistan almost it's just exactly. without war <laughs> look, at, look at his career I mean it's just insane it's uh, it's and and that guy was starting from not much at the beginning and it was like a challenge when it comes to being able to have yeah. his art reach like maybe the industry and now look at where he is you know, you know so what's crazy with, about Jama specifically is that he started way later than I did and he's older than me and i consider him to be fucking miles ahead when it comes to like creative thinking dude he's oh, yeah. he's yeah. such a fucking great person uh, yeah. yeah he comes from tajikistan like i come from poland and i was born in the eastern bloc uh during like the the iron curtain that's that's i mean not a, not as bad as third world country where you have you know 
war torn Somalia or something that that's obviously fucking completely different difficulty level. But I know a couple of artists from Syria. I know a couple of artists from I, I see an artist from Iran that are fucking amazing at what they do and they do work. So it's that guy called um, Amir Zand. I follow him on tw- on uh, on um, Instagram. <coughs> sorry, on Instagram, and I think he's in Tehran and Iran. And uh, yeah. as you already know, you know, uh, walking and and being able to <clears throat> just like saying exactly what you want in Iran is just not exactly the same. And uh, and right. free speech uh, and the political issues out of Iran, even though it's a pretty modern country, is in by many standards. It's still complicated for an artist to be in succeeding like the way it is uh, uh, in the West. Yeah. Nonetheless, you have guys like this. I bet he's going to go far. He's already having book covers, propositions, and all this stuff. So that's really good. That's amazing. And it's another case, you know, that shows that shows that it's it's feasible, but it's hard. That's a short fact. We're not yeah. all equal when it comes to this. We'll never be. I mean, we we can get close unless <laughs> unless we decide all as a humanity decide like well let's go with CRISPR and just design a new human <laughs> then then obviously that's a different story uh, unfolding but um I, I don't think for a long time we'll be at a place where we can say like oh it's we all all start with the equal footing no that's not gonna happen even even the fact that we're genetically different but hey i had that in my talk uh, at thu where i said um when you're starting with like really shitty circumstances where you're just basically instead of being like logs being thrown under your feet, it's basically, you know, everyone is trying fucking cinder blocks at your head. Uh, when you're starting with that and you can survive that, you will have so much better career than someone who's, who started with the cushion of knowing everything and everyone. Um, exactly. And, it's really uh, like that type of uh, social uh, pressure and social complexity that that makes people who they are. Again, it goes back. It throws us back to the the previous conversation about why do we create in the first place? And it does help. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, look at the struggle. Like a lot of uh, artists have, that struggle is very often a source of immense creativity. Yeah. That's the way it goes, and that's how life goes. This is why I guess that maybe a proper mindset for artists is to always have a bit of a constant reminder that there's an end to the adventure of life, you know. And as a result, uh, if you, it's not about saying I'm going to freak out because I'm going to count the days before my own death. It's just saying I have that period of time, and how am I going to use it? How am I going to be a better artist? What am I wanting to do? And, you know, when I, I am, again, I'm not that old. I'm 46. But obviously, in my brain, I'm still in my 20s, you know. But my <laughs> body is not. And as it's very interesting to realize this because when you reach 40 and when you reach, you know, 46, now I'm in the second half of the, of the 40s. It's another milestone again. And you're like, wait a minute. My life is, is like, kind of, like, immensely behind me. And I still have a lot of things. You're I about to make. die. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what I mean? It's it it's even more of something you think about yeah. because of because suddenly you have some of the friends that have the same age. They're just like they just they're gone. They're gone because of cancer or because of any reason. And yeah. and yeah. you're like, okay, I have things to do, you know. And it's uh, I want to make tangible results, and 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 you got to keep the passion going for that. Yeah, deep dude deep <laughs> all right man let's wrap it up here it was such a right. such a cool conversation man it was it was good to catch up too so um yeah. yeah let's wrap it up uh i had a i had a fun i hope you i hope you did as well uh i'm pretty sure i'm looking at the chat people were having fun for sure uh listening to this so uh let's do it again man uh in the near future whenever you're you're free i'm okay. definitely definitely up for that and if you're up for that we can we can organize something something so uh i don't i don't think anyone would be mad to hear you hear some more from you so <laughs> my uh my uh, youtube page was uh uh the youtube i mean the page i had was actually had uh crashed so i was not seeing any of the questions i'm seeing some of it right now i'm seeing roman joan to talk about stuff to i'll try to uh I'll try to just come back to some of these uh, questions and give a bit of a fast answer in the future. And we yeah. can do more. It's all good. 
Yeah, sounds good, man. Sounds good. Have a good night's sleep, man. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna get to do some work, wrap my evening, and and get to sleep. <laughs> it's pretty hard right, here. I'm very courageous. I'm not gonna do any work. I'm going to <laughs> have my two dogs outside for a while, and then after a good glass of wine that I just finished, I'm just gonna sleep because I need to. Oh Thanks boy! Thanks for the proposition and thanks for the. Uh, I mean the. Uh, yeah, it was the, fun, man. That was definitely fun. fun. The invite All right. for this, it was great, and uh, and uh, again, I'm uh, I'm honored being here. So, again, yep. thank you. Thanks, dude. I likewise. You're a legend, dude. You're a legend. So. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, All right. Thanks, guys, for coming. Uh, and uh, till the next time. Bye, bye.